Welcome back, everybody. This is Michael at the Nebraska Library Commission, and you are watching a big talk from small libraries. It is now 1 o'clock in the afternoon central time, and we're now moving on to Bob Jones from the Milton Freewater Public Library in Oregon, and he's going to be giving us his presentation, Oldies Night at the Library. Uh, welcome, Bob, and take it away. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world right now. And welcome to Oldies Night at the Library, also known as Three Hours of Cheap, Trashy Rock and Roll. I'm Bob Jones from the Milton Freewater Public Library in Milton Freewater, Oregon. And I want to tell you about a program that we created at our library a little over seven years ago. It's, of course, nothing's working right now. There we go. Um, this is a picture of our new library, which opened 10 years ago. Our library is 100 years old. And for the first five years, it was in a little building about the size of a one-car garage. Then it moved into a Carnegie building. And we were there for 85 years till we got into our new building in 2003, which made us very deliriously happy. Milton Freewater is a town of about 7,000 people in northeastern Oregon, about 250 miles east of Portland, and 10 miles south of legendary Walla Walla, Washington. I thought I would start out today by giving you some background on Oldies Night at the Library in the form of uh, answering some who, what, when, where, and why questions about the program. First of all, you might be asking, just what is Oldies Night? Well, it's a program of recorded popular music from the 1950s through the 1980s with commentary on the songs, the artists, and the times. And why did I create it? How did I come up with this idea, I hear you ask? Well, I was sitting around in December of 2005, and I wanted to come up with something new and different we could do at the library, which would attract new people who didn't ordinarily come to the library and would be within the limits of our existing resources. Uh, in other words, we didn't have any money for new staff, new equipment, or new materials, so we had to work with what was available to us. And our very first Oldies Night was held in January 2006 when we presented a time sweep of songs from 1955 through 1985 with one song from each of those years. Now, tomorrow evening, We'll be hosting the 86th installment of Oldies Night, featuring 61 songs from the year 1963, which was the year before the Beatles came to America. And for us, Oldies Night takes place in a community room in our library, which is about 32 by 34 feet or 1,100 square feet. And I hear people saying, hold the phone there. Our whole library is like 1,100 square feet. But that's all right, because Oldies Night can fit into almost any available space. Thanks to Libraries of Eastern Oregon, we've been able to take Oldies Night on the road to about a dozen other libraries around the state, some of them quite tiny, and some of them had spaces quite large. At one, we went to a senior citizen center that had about 3,000 square feet. So you can do it anywhere. Now, who plans and conducts it? In our case, I do all the planning, organizing, promotion, and execution. That way it doesn't cost the library anything because I'm on a salary, so there's no extra hours, no overtime pay, none of those problems. And I do it because I love the music and I was a disc jockey on college radio both as an undergraduate in Iowa and later on in graduate school in Illinois. And it has evolved quite a bit over the years. In the beginning, we started out with a different theme each month, but we didn't have a set playlist. I would just bring 40 or 50 CDs from my collection at home, and I would pick the songs as I went along. And I also set out refreshments and a container for donations so people could help pay for the refreshments. Nowadays, we also still have a theme, and we have a different theme each month, but we have a set playlist ahead of time, and I put all the songs onto a couple of CDRs, and that makes it run much smoother and go faster. We can do more songs. Uh, we also now have two vending machines in the library, although Oldies Night was not the reason for getting the vending machines, but one has drinks, the other one has candy and snacks. 
but some people still bring their own refreshments and they usually bring enough to share with others. And I hear you say, okay, good for you, that's great, but what's in it for me? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because the number one reason to do Oldies Night is to have fun. If the person who's doing the program is not having fun, or if the people who are attending it aren't having fun, then maybe Oldies Night isn't exactly the right fit for your library. Now here's some photos from our very first Oldies Night back in 2006. You'll see a couple of ladies teaching people how to do the stroll, and they're actually too young to have been doing the stroll in 1957. Um, picture of your smiling disc jockey, BJ the DJ, and an overall picture of some of the people who attended. Okay, what else? Well, it'll provide your community with a new and different activity which is both entertaining and educational. And you say, wait a minute, educational? Well, sure. A properly produced oldies night can provide interesting information about the songs and the recording artists. And it can provide facts about musical trends, record companies, recording technology, and record collecting. And you can throw in tidbits about the historical context what else was going on in the world when this music was popular? That might be wars, politics, Broadway musicals, uh, movies, and fashion trends, for example. So you say, oh, well, tell me some more. Well, it can generate a surprising amount of awareness for your library. And it can engender goodwill toward your library. Because even people who never quite make it to Oldies Night think it's a good thing. So just one well-written news release each month does two things. It tells people what's coming up for that month's program and it reminds them to come out. But it also creates a positive impression of your library among all those folks who never actually attend Oldies Night. And you say, okay, so far so good. Anything else? Well, it may bring unexpected new connections and partnerships to your library. You never know who's going to take notice of Oldies Night. So you might make a connection with a local business, with a school, hard telling. And it can garner unexpected attention and recognition for your library. You might end up having your local newspaper come out and do a feature story on it. Or if you're really lucky, you might even have a TV or a radio station come out and do a story or a remote broadcast from your library. And it can improve your status in the library community in your state or region because the word gets around. Uh, word of mouth is great publicity and eventually people will say, hey, I heard that library over yonder is doing this oldies music program and it sounds really interesting, it sounds like a good thing. And it can even increase your circulation and attract new borrowers because it's going to draw in people who haven't previously come to the library so they might get a library card and they might check out books, movies, sound recordings, maybe some of it related to your programs and some not. So you say, okay, how can I start an Oldies Night program on my library? Well, you're going to need a minimum of three things to make Oldies Night happen at your library. You're going to need an Oldies music junkie, that is a person who is really into the music. You're going to need some sound equipment so that you can play the music and you're going to have a room to hold the event in. Those are the major things, but there are a few others. So the first thing you need is an oldies music junkie. Now, a real oldies music junkie not only loves the music, but is knowledgeable about it and usually has a large and varied music library of their own and some essential music reference books. Now, oldies junkies quite often are people who have actually given up on oldies radio because it's too repetitious and where they have 20,000 oldies to choose from, their playlist is maybe 400 songs that sounds like 40. So they listen to their own music. Now, it's really great if your oldies person has their own music library because you don't want to have to provide all that music. It gets really expensive in a hurry. And you may not want to have to provide the reference books either. You'll need some sound equipment to do the program, obviously. Uh, a good home stereo receiver or integrated amplifier will do the trick. Your music source can be 
vinyl records, it can be tapes, whether that's cassettes or open reel or even eight tracks. It can be CDs. It can be some digital source, such as an MP3 player, a uh, computer hard drive, a tablet. And you'll need some speakers, at least two, obviously, because the music's going to be in stereo. Maybe more if it's a really big room. And you might need a microphone. That depends on how big is the room, how many people are in attendance, and how well do you project your voice without a microphone. Now, the equipment doesn't have to be brand new, but it should be good quality and it should be in good working order. And the speakers are really important because you don't want this to sound like somebody's old transistor radio. The receiver or the amplifier is important because it has to have enough power to drive the speakers without clipping, that is, without distorting. Now, here's some examples of stuff you might use. Uh, typical receiver from about 30 years ago. Um, I have no idea why that Mind the Gap London Transport Cup is there. A pair of speakers, two-way or three-way speakers are good. And in case you're using CDs, a CD player or a CD recorder. This one in the picture is interesting because it combines on one side a CD recorder and on the other side a cassette recorder. So you can take old cassette tapes and dub them directly onto CDs. And if for some reason you want to copy a CD onto a cassette, you can do that too. And if you want to use both cassettes and CDs in your program, there it is all in one package. Now your oldies music person might have his or her own sound system that they're willing to bring to oldies night. Um, or you may have a local retail store that sells sound equipment and they might donate some to your library in exchange for a little plug like putting up a sign that says uh, audio equipment provided by so-and-so. If neither of those things works out, I am sure there is someone in your community who has an old stereo component system that they don't use anymore, don't need anymore, and they might be willing to donate to you, especially if they can take a deduction off their income tax. You need a room to hold the event in, and almost any room will work. Um, if possible, do the program in your library. If you have a meeting room, that's great. If you have a space where you can move tables and whatnot aside, that's great too, because you're doing this to promote your library, and you would like to bring people into your library. In our case, Oldies Night happens after regular library hours, so we don't have to worry about making noise and bothering people in the library. If you don't have any space in your library building. You may have somewhere else in your community where you can get a room for free, maybe at a school, at a church, a fraternal lodge, or a service club, or a community center. But if you absolutely have to rent space, if you can't get a free space, at least do your best to negotiate a discount. Now, you might say, OK, I want a bare floor so people can dance, and that's a good idea. We've been using a carpeted room all along, and it hasn't been a problem. It's nice to have some small tables, not bigger than card tables, uh, where people can sit because they like to set their stuff down, especially if they have drinks or snacks. And I think small tables work better than big conference tables, and certainly better than no tables at all. Once you found a room that looks good, set up your sound equipment, and check the acoustics of the room to make sure it's going to sound good when you play music in it. And you say, all right, what else? Well, here's a tough one. Recorded music is protected by copyright, just like books are. When you play it for the public, you may need a performing rights license. Because when you buy a record, a tape, a CD, you can play it at home for yourself for your family, for your friends, that's perfectly legal. But when you start playing it for the public at your library, you may need a license. Now, it's a little bit complicated. There are some conditions under which you don't need one, and so you would want to check with a lawyer, have them look at the rules of the game and see what they think. If you have a city attorney or a county attorney, that's good. If you have a lawyer who's on your library board or your friend's board, that's good too. 
Uh, or you might just have a lawyer in your community who would do this for you for free. Now, some songs are licensed by ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And others are licensed by BMI, Broadcast Music Incorporated. Uh, a writer or a publisher cannot belong to both ASCAP and BMI at the same time. So there's virtually no overlap between those two. Some of the music you play will be ASCAP and some of it will be BMI. So if you're going to need a license, you really need licenses from both of them. They both have websites, www.ascap.com slash licensing and www.bmi.com slash licensing. Go there, take a look at what it says. You can send them an email. Uh, you can call them on the phone if you have questions. Uh, of course, they're going to try to convince you you need a license. That's why you might want to have a lawyer look at it also. And you say, okay, what else? Well, you'll need some reference materials uh, because you want to be able to provide facts about the music. And there are two things I recommend very highly, books published by Record Research of Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and written by Joel Whitburn. Joel Whitburn founded Record Research back in 1970. And he's actually published dozens of books. The two that would probably be most essential would be Top Pop Singles and Pop Annual. More about those in a minute. Some other books that are also very good. The Guinness Book of British Hit Singles. They also did a Guinness Book of British Hit Albums. And the last few editions were called British Hit Singles and Albums. I don't think they're currently publishing new editions of that, but you can get second-hand copies of older editions from a number of online sources. In Chicago, a disc jockey named Ron Smith has published a series of books based on the charts from WLS and WCFL radio. <coughs> Excuse me. And you say, okay, I'm not in Chicago. Why do I care about WLS or WCFL? Well, they were both big 50,000 watt stations. And in the case of WLS, they're what was called a clear channel station, which has nothing to do with the company called Clear Channel. It means that there weren't any other stations on 890, at least nothing late at night and nothing 50,000 watts. This meant that anybody west of the Alleghenies and east of the Rockies could probably pick up WLS at night. So lots of teenagers in small towns uh, could listen to WLS and hear music that they weren't hearing on their local radio station. So those are useful for a big chunk of the country, actually. In Canada, a guy named Ron Hall did basically the same thing with the popularity charts from CHUM in Toronto, Ontario, called the Chum Chart Book. And I think that one is also out of print like the British Hit Singles book and the ones I've seen online are kind of expensive but still you might look at it because if you're in Canada or if you're near the Canadian border in the US you probably have people who listened to Chum or stations like it such as CKLW in Windsor. Okay, Joel Whitmer's Top Pop Singles. Uh, different editions of it have completely different cover art so this is just an example. It lists every single song to ever make the Billboard Hot 100 charts. And he goes back to 1955, which is actually three years before the Hot 100 debuted, and goes up to usually within a year of the publication date of the book. You don't necessarily need the newest version because you're not playing new music, you're playing oldies. So you can find older editions at a number of sites online. If you go to his website at recordresearch.com, he usually has the previous edition marked down for clearance when he has a new one out. So it lists every song that made the Hot 100. And a related book is the Billboard Pop Annual, which also lists every song that ever made the Hot 100, but in a different format. And we're going to look at some examples of those. This is a page from the Top Pop Singles book. And it's arranged alphabetically by the name of the recording artist. So for each recording artist, it's going to list all their hits. It'll give their name. It usually gives a little information about the artist. 
It'll give the year when they had their peak popularity. For each song, it'll tell you the date that it first entered the Hot 100 chart, how high did it get on the chart, and how many weeks was it on the chart. The song title, uh, the newer editions will also give you the song on the B-side of the single. It'll give you an estimate of what that 45 is worth as a collectible record. Um, it'll tell you, it's got some codes to tell you if it's a foreign language song or an instrumental or whatever. It'll give you the record label and the number of the record. So some people have just one song, some people have dozens or even more than a hundred songs. This is sample pages from the Pop Annual book. It takes the same information but it presents it differently. So we're looking at the beginning of the listings for 1967 and it shows you the top 20 artists, the people who were most popular on the Hot 100 that year, the top songwriters for that year, and top artists who debuted that year, people who eventually became part of the 500 most popular people in the history of the Billboard charts, but had their very first Billboard uh, hit single in 1967. Then it lists all those songs, and it'll put them in order, all the songs that peaked at number one, the ones that peaked at number two, and so on, down to the songs that made number 100 for one week that only the songwriter's mother and the performer themselves remember at all. <coughs> Excuse me. And so for 1967, there were about 700 songs that made the charts. Here's a cover of the seventh edition of British Hit Singles. Uh, again, the covers look a little different. The graphics may look a little different. And almost any edition of it would be perfectly fine for doing an oldies program. The one in the middle here is uh, Ron Smith's WCFL, Chicago Top 40 Charts, 1965 to 76, because CFL was only a Top 40 station for 11 years, but it was a big competitor to WLS at that time. And on the right, you have the Chum Chart Book, uh, CHUM, uh, published a popularity chart from 1957 up till 1986. And on the bottom, the three books that Ron Smith did on WLS, one each for the 1960s, the 70s, and the 80s. So you say, okay, now I get all this stuff together, how do I actually create an oldies program? Well, first you have to pick a theme, and you'll need a different theme for every month. We've been doing this for 86 months, and we rarely repeat a theme, although Sometimes in February, it's hard to resist doing Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, for example. So your theme can be a time period like the British Invasion, hits of, say, 64 and 65, or the Summer of Love in the summer of 67. It can be a single year, hits of 1956 or 1967, 1975, whatever. It can be a certain type of music, like Motown music or surf music, or folk music. It can be a single recording artist, and that could be a male vocalist like Elvis Presley or Elton John. Could be a female vocalist like Madonna or Aretha Franklin. Could be a group like Sam and Dave or the Beatles or the Beach Boys or Creedence Clearwater Revival. Or it could be a historical event which influenced music, such as um, a war or a big political event, or um, Woodstock, that certainly influenced music for quite a while. So once you've picked a theme, then you need to create a playlist of songs that you might want to include in your program. And I usually start out with probably 75 songs, even though I know I can't play more than about half that in a three-hour program. And I put them into a database, because if you put the songs into a database, for each song you've got a field for the recording artist, the song title, the date, the chart position, uh, any other information you want to include, what album it came off of, or um, just some notes. And once you have it in the database, then you can rearrange it uh, as you're preparing your program, and you can sort it by the artists, by the song titles, by the dates, by the chart positions, whatever fields you've created. If you do it in a word processing program, not real easy to rearrange 
the information. I always try to include some big hits that everyone will remember, uh, makes them feel good, say, hey, I remember that song. So for example, for tomorrow night, for 1963, we'll be including some songs that made number one, 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 like Hey Paula by Paula and Paula, and Sugar Shack by Jimmy Gilmer and the Fireballs, and I'm Leaving It All Up to You by Dale and Grace, 11 years before Donnie and Marie got a hold of that song. Then I try to include some songs that made the top 20, but you never hear them on the oldies radio shows because oldies radio rarely plays anything that didn't make the top 10 or even the top 5. So examples of those would be things like, for 1963, Wonderful Summer by Robin Ward, her only big hit. Um, Follow the Boys by Connie Francis, who had lots of hits. Or Mecca by Gene Pitney, which today would probably be considered a politically incorrect song. Then, I also like to put in some really obscure songs, things that maybe nobody in the room has heard before, but they will find them interesting, amusing, might even become their new favorite song, who knows. So for example, for 1963, we're including What a Guy by the Raindrops. We're including Desert Pete by the Kingston Trio. They had a lot of hits. This one only made number 33 on Billboard, so a lot of people will have forgotten it if they ever heard it at all. And Long Tall Texan by Murray Kellum, which only made number 51 on Billboard, but it was number 15 in Chicago and probably number one in a lot of places in Texas. Okay. Then I try to have at least two hours of music for a three-hour program. So we have to have time to talk about the music, um, but you want to have enough music to fill up your time. I try to include the dates and the chart positions for each song, either when did it come on the charts or when did it reach its highest chart position, its peak, uh, and how high did it get on the charts. And sometimes I'll talk about the fact that a song like <clears throat> Long Tall Texan didn't do all that well nationally, but in some places it did really, really well. So sometimes there are songs that were big hits nationally, but where you lived, they didn't get airplay at all, and you may never have heard of them. I try to remember to include the name of the recording artist and the song title, because I really hate it if I'm listening to the radio and they play a song and they do not announce what the song was or who sang it. It makes it really hard to track it down if I say, I'd like to buy that song. And I try to include some little fact or tidbit of information about each song. Uh, something about the artist, something about the times, something about what uh, inspired the song. This is an example of uh, just part of a database that I create when I'm putting together a playlist. This happened to be a list of songs when I was doing a program on doo-wop music. And you'll notice up at the top two different versions of Shaboom, the original version by the Chords, which made number five, and the cover version by the Crew Cuts, which made number one. And farther down the list, you'll see two versions of Little Darlin, the original by the Gladiolas, which only made number 41, and the cover version, the big hit by the Diamonds, made number two. If you've ever heard the Gladiolas version, you'll understand why it only made number 41. So you want to get all your songs together. You're going to look at this big list that you made and say, okay, how many of these do I actually have, and how many would I have to go find somewhere? And sometimes there's a song you'd like to play, but you can't track down a copy of it. It's not available from iTunes. It's not available uh, from Amazon. It just doesn't seem to be out there. Or you can find a copy but it's kind of expensive and you don't really want to spend that much for the song. So you drop those songs from the list. That's why you start out with more songs than you're actually going to play. And then sometimes you have competing versions of a song as we saw with Shaboom. Uh, and you probably don't want to play both versions. Back in the 50s it was not unusual for three or four or even a half a dozen artists to all simultaneous release versions of the same song and fight it out for airplay and record sales and jukebox sales. You want to try to get the best quality copy of each song. 
if you start out with a scratchy old 45 that looks like somebody used it for a doormat, uh, you might want to try to find a better quality copy of the song. Now remember, it's always legal to buy a song, whether you buy it as a physical record tape or CD or as a digital download, that's perfectly legal. It's almost always legal to borrow a copy of a song from somebody else and use their record or tape or CD. It is not legal to copy their record tape or CD onto your own CD or tape or data file on your hard drive. So if you own all of the records, tapes, and CDs that you're going to use, you can legally compile them into a master recording for your program. As I said, currently I'm doing this on CDRs. Uh, you can do it differently. Once you've made this wonderful master recording to use for your program, it is not legal for you to sell a copy of it or to trade a copy for something else or even to give it away free. And sooner or later, somebody will come up to you after your program and say, wow, I love that music. Can I get a copy of it? And you have to say, no, sorry, can't do that. You might say, well, I'll be happy to loan you my copy. Just don't tell me if you make a copy because I don't want to hear that. Now, your master recording could be on a tape. It could be on a CD. It could be on an iPod, a flash drive, a hard drive, a tablet. You know, a lot of different possibilities. You want to publicize your event for two reasons. Number one, you want people to know about it and come to the event. Uh, number two, you want the whole community to know about it even if they don't come because then they're aware that something's happening at the library and they will think well of you for that. At least we hope they will. So you do a news release to your local newspapers, your local radio stations, your local TV stations. It should be concise. It should be well written. It should be proofread to eliminate errors and in the form that they want to receive it. And these days, most places want to get it electronically, generally as an email. In case you never took a journalism class in high school or college, you want to answer the basic questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. The more questions you answer up front, the fewer excuses people have to say, well, I don't even know what's going on. I don't think I'll go to that program. If your library or your city or your county or your library district has a website or a Facebook page or some other social media, use that to publicize Oldies Night. Uh, you might make posters and put them around town. If businesses are willing to put a little notice up on their reader boards, that would be good as well. This is an example of a handout that I give at Oldies Night. We didn't always do that, but for the past two or three years, we've done it every month. This happens to be a program of hits from 1958, which was a pretty important year in the history of rock and roll radio. Um, starts out, and they're in, alpha, or in chronological order according to when they hit their peak on billboards, starting with At the Hop by Danny and the Juniors from January, and winding up with Whole Lot of Lovin' by Fats Domino and Smoke Gets in Your Eyes by The Platters, which actually peaked in January of 59, but they came on the charts late in 58. This is a graphic that my wife came up with for us for Oldies Night. She took some uh, online clip art, assembled it, and customized it uh, just for us. Changed some of the colors, obviously added the text at the bottom, uh, changed the logo on the Letterman sweater to the OP from my high school back in Oak Park, Illinois. This is a handout we did for a program for a single recording artist, in this case the Bee Gees, and it includes 41 songs, uh, not only the big hits that they had that everybody remembers, but it starts out with their very first Australian hit, a song called Spicks and Specks from 1966. Uh, they didn't even make the American charts till the middle of 67. Okay. And it ends up with a couple of interesting songs. One from 1997, Ellen Vannon, which is the unofficial Manx National Anthem, and all three of the Bee Gees were born on the Isle of Man, so they had some affinity for that place. And this was only released as a charity thing on the Isle of Man for one of the service clubs there, a thousand copies, so it would be a very collectible record. 
but you can find it online. You can find YouTube videos of them performing it live in concert. Uh, and then a Celine Dion song from 1998 called Immortality, which was written by the Bee Gees, and I think they did backing vocals on it as well. All right. You have your equipment. You have your disc jockey. You have your music. Uh, you have done some publicity, so you want to set up your venue and get ready for your program. So you're going to set up your audio equipment, and you're going to test it with the actual recording that you're going to use for your program to make sure that everything works correctly. You're going to set up your tables and chairs. You're going to check the heating and air conditioning and make sure the temperature is okay and is adjustable. You're going to possibly put up some signs inside and outside the building to let people know what's going on. You're going to check your lighting levels because you do not want it to be so dark that your disc jockey needs a miner's helmet with a lamp on the front of it to read his own playlist. And then when you've got everything ready to go, you're going to try to relax and kind of collapse in a heap until time to go. When you get to starting time, you want to try to start on time. You owe that to the people who showed up on time. And the people who choose to come late, well, they knew what time it was starting anyway. You want to be sure to welcome your audience. Uh, and then you want to play that cheap, trashy rock and roll or whatever kind of music you're playing. You'll need to adjust your sound levels uh, because it might be too loud, might not be loud enough. Likewise, you want to just adjust your heating and air conditioning. Uh, don't want it to be too hot or too cold. Um, and you want to interact with the audience. Talk to them. Solicit comments from them. Uh, answer their questions. And it's important that you have fun and that the people attending the program have fun and that you try to wrap it up on time because, you know, people have other things to do. And at the end of the program, be sure to say thank you and you all hurry back now, you hear? Because you want to encourage people to come back next month. When it's all over, you need to evaluate the program. Now, you might provide, at least for the first few times you do it, some little feedback forms that people can fill out quickly and easily. You don't want to ask them to write a long essay, uh, but you want to get their feedback on what they liked, what they didn't like. Uh, so ask yourself, well, what went well? What problems cropped up? And what can we do to make it better next time? Because there will be a next time. No matter how well it went, there's always room for improvement. No matter how poorly it went, there are ways to fix it. And you should always be open to change, try something new, drop something that obviously didn't work at all, or tweak something that kind of sort of worked, but not quite the way you thought it would. Now, you might need to contact me. You might want to contact me to find out uh, information about how to do Oldies Night at your library. You see there my address that you can use to contact me through the U.S. Postal Service, who needs all the business they can get. Also, the phone number that rings right on my desk and the uh, library page of our city's website so that you can uh, go there and on that library page you'll find an email link to me and also that same phone number to call me up. And that's just about all I can tell you, but I know there will be some people who have some questions, comments, or complaints. So let's have at it. <laughs> yes, yeah. we do. Uh, that was great, yeah. And, um, how much does it usually cost for the licensing? And do you pay Well, that's a how high is up question because it depends on the size of your library and what all you're doing with music. Uh, obviously, if you were going to uh, stream the event online, that would probably cost more. Or if you were going to have it broadcast over your local radio station, that would cost more, but the radio stations should probably cover that. Um, in our case, the city has a license with ASCAP, and it's costing $327 a year. But that's for all city departments. Mm -hmm. um, we're working on getting a license with BMI, and that's going to be $225 a year. So I can hear the tiny library saying, oh my god, we can't afford that. Well, that's why you should talk to a lawyer mm -hmm. who might even give you his opinion pro bono and tell you whether you really need the license. And it's something that you might get a donor or your friend's group to help cover the cost of. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I totally forgot about that. We got by okay. without any license oh, for a long wait. time. Don't tell ASCAP and BMI that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I um, We have one comment from someone that I definitely agree with what Bob says. Find out because someone says that their city was fine for playing music over a loudspeaker. They didn't have the proper license, but they do now. So if they find out, you can get a fine. And yeah, there are limits on yeah. what they consider rebroadcasting music, and this is a case that goes back about 40 years ago to a retail store that was piping music throughout their store from the radio. Mm -hmm. Now, if they just had a radio sitting on the counter playing, that was legal. But once they put it into multiple speakers, that was considered broadcasting, and they had to get a license. Yep. So, yeah, you might want to look at uh, both the ASCAP and BMI sites to see uh, what you can do where you don't need a license. Okay, on to some more things that are not going to get us in trouble legally. Um, how many people <laughs> about on average do you have uh, attend these shows, these events? Now, the ones here in our library, I've never had more than 30 people, hmm. uh, and sometimes just a handful. But I do have some very loyal people. I've got a couple who come down from Prescott, Washington, which is about 30 miles, and they forgot to build a freeway between Prescott and Milton Freewater. And I've got people who come up from Pendleton, which is about 30 miles south of us. Um, but we probably average about 10 people. But when I've done the roadshow versions, I've had 50 and 75 people show up for those. It just depend on your community, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the community and what day of the week and what time of day and a lot of other things, I suppose. And You're always going to be competing with something. Mm -hmm. What about the age group, the ages of the people that come? Most of the people who turn out are people who are old enough to remember music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had teenagers who are musical archaeologists coming to the program. <laughs> <laughs> and be because we have some people considerably older than me, we've actually on several occasions gone back and done swing era and big band music from the 30s oh, and man. the 40s, and they just love that. Nice. And there's a lot of people that are interested in the older music, too. I mean, it's going, getting the swing dancing and whatnot is, is very popular, so you never know who you might get. Right. And, of course, every area is going to be different. In some places, you'd have more demand to do country oldies or rhythm and blues oldies. Hard telling. Right. I don't remember if you said, um, how long have, has have you been doing this? Uh, we've been doing it a little over seven years. Wow. Okay. So then it's a success, obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, like I say, it doesn't cost us anything, and I love to do it, so uh, I figure I don't need 100 people to show up to make it worth my while to do the program. <laughs> because, again we get an awful lot of awareness among people who never ever come to oldies night. Uh, people that I meet up with at the grocery store, they've heard about oldies night, they think it's a wonderful thing, uh, but they've never actually made it to oldies night. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because it means they're thinking good things about the library. Hmm. Um, here's an interesting comment we got from actually one of our previous speakers um, about there are, this is an out there kind of thing, but there are some video games that are using old music. Um, Fallout 3 specifically is using this kind of, this, this era of music. So a good way to possibly connect with other generations is have a video game music night. And they might think it's video game music, but it's actually this kind of music that happens to have been used in the games. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different angles you can use. Mm -hmm. um, again, assuming that you have a motion picture license, you could show video clips or short films to go with Oldies Night as well. Mm -hmm. there, okay, there's uh, a uh, group, go ahead. No, go ahead if you want to continue. Oh, there, there's a group of, uh, I think it's mostly writers like Stephen King that like to get together and play rock and roll oldies and they're called the Rock Bottom Remainders. Yep. And we've we've showed a Rock Bottom Remainders video at Oldies Night. Oh, cool. So that connects it to the library, which is an interesting because a question someone just asked the question, does this program generate any activity support or funding for the library? I think it has uh, attracted new users to the library and it's always hard to say if if it's directly 
uh, affected support for the library. Right now, we are quite fortunate that we get good support from our city manager and our city council, and we're part of a library district, so we automatically get money every year from the district. Um, but we're doing quite well, especially since we moved into the new library building. Of course, that increased library use a lot. And uh, so the amount of money we take in every month is a lot higher than it was uh, before we got into the new library building. But I don't know how much of that we can directly attribute to Oldies Night. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of a general question. <laughs> what does the audience actually do for those three hours? Do they eat? Do they dance? What is actually, you know, while you're playing the music, what are they all? Well, it varies. Sometimes, some people just want to listen to the music. Mm -hmm. uh, some people, like I say, bring snacks and eat snacks. Um, between songs, they will ask questions about the music or make comments about the music. Um, and sometimes they get up and dance, not always. <laughs> um, yeah, Bob, I had a, a question. Um, now I'm trying to remember. Oh, yes. When, when you were going through your, your resources for finding out what the hits were, we right. were commenting and, and finding it kind of cool that you kept pointing to books. <laughs> Right. Uh, and 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 you know we're like you know kicking it old school that was great. My my question is is you know not to get away from the book specifically, but you know if they are are older and harder to find or or maybe cost a bit or outside of the budget, are there online resources for that similar sort of of, of uh, you know the, the 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 chart toppers and things like that that you can yeah, recommend? There are online resources. Um, I'm not sure how much faith I have in some of them because generally the, the source that's considered most authoritative nationwide for the U.S. is Billboard magazine. And all the Billboard chart information is copyrighted. And this guy, Joel Whitburn in Wisconsin, kind of has an exclusive uh, license to compile that into books and e-books. Okay? So you might find somebody who has a list of They'll say the top hits of 1970, but you don't know for sure where they got them from or how accurate their list is. But you can find a lot of that online. So, so you're not necessarily recommending, say, Wikipedia? Um, well, like with anything else on Wikipedia, <laughs> uh, it can change from minute to minute. So sure. uh, yeah, it's not always reliable information out there, although there's a lot out there. and especially the older editions of Joel Whitburn's stuff, you can buy pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. And just within the last few years, he started uh, creating e-books and um, uh, like CD-ROM books of some of his stuff, uh, if you have some aversion to ink on paper. Um, some other um, programs have mentioned this, and uh, someone now has a question. Do you ever have any library materials available for checkout at the events, like things that are related to whatever the is going, uh, whatever music you're doing that night? Yeah, sometimes we do. If we have books or videos or uh, audio recordings that would be related to the topic for the night, we'll make them available to people. Um, we don't really push that a lot. But, uh, yeah, from time to time, we'll remind people, you know, if you like this stuff, you can check it out from the library. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stealth marketing. Well, if you have a good, uh, you know, if the library has a good CD collection, you know, you can, you can pull the stuff that has what was on the playlist if you have a right. collection also. In our case, the library has a moderately good music collection. But I have an outrageously big one at home, and in spite of that, almost every month I find myself buying more CDs just for oldies night. Well, that's half for the example, fun. For <laughs> example, I now have about five CDs of Aretha Franklin, when otherwise I would probably only have one. Cool. Um, I, I have one other. Back, back to the licensing. As, is licensing sure. and copyright is something I'm personally interested in. Um, do they? You mentioned your city pays, you know, an annual license. Do like a one-off night license exist? Uh, is that something that's even something you could consider possibly looking into? I am not aware of it. It's possible, and I, okay. I'm supposing that there probably are times when people do a one-time event and they want to get a license just to cover the event, so mm -hmm. it's possible that they offer that. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I know of libraries that get like single night liquor licenses for events, and I, yeah, so I was wondering right, if you could do that right. with the music. Okay. Do you know if, for instance, you could get a license that would cover the whole state? Here in Nebraska, we have a license for, um, for the public libraries to show motion pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm going to say that the state library, or in your case, the Nebraska Library Commission, probably could get a statewide license that would cover all the public libraries in Nebraska. I have no idea what that would cost, <laughs> but it costs nothing to ask ASCAP and BMI what they would charge. Okay, because mm -hmm. it would be extremely cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And and just to stress, you really would recommend getting both of them just to kind of cover you because you don't really know who's going to be with which one. Well, that's it. And you never know when somebody's brother-in-law who works for a music publisher will show up at Oldies Night because he's visiting in your town. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Um, any other questions or comments from the audience? Um, yeah, Phil, but use the question section of your interface. We, we have a lot of time here um, the, to ask any questions, comments, anything you want to share about any of these events you've done at your library. Um, we did have someone talk about how they had a, um, they have a, a, a theater in their library that they use for showing movies, but they do switch it over to do um, music nights um, using um, for the teens, okay. using, and just using their um, personal iPods and music they've downloaded um, to do a, um, so they have something that they, it's actually a theater they have in their library. And, and, oh, very do you, good. and do you travel out of state to do this? <laughs> I haven't so far, but, you know, I, I have a feeling that eventually that'll happen. <laughs> okay. Well, especially because we're very close to Washington, and so I think it'll spill over, you know, to Walla Walla or the Tri-Cities sooner or later. Mm. All right, let me, and maybe this is, this is getting a little more commercial, but, but again, back to the licensing for a sec. If, if like, a library was to offer to hire you, let's say, would would you as the DJ pay the licensing and pass that cost on, or would that be something you would expect the library to take care of? Um, yeah, let's say when I retire, I decide I'm going to become an oldies disc jockey and take this program wherever they're willing to pay me to go. Sure. Then That's I would expect that I would take care of the licensing. Okay. All right. Well, I'm thinking, you know, in, in if if the library was to find somebody in town, would the library assume that it would be covered in the fee, or would they have to cover you? But you'd have to talk to the DJ. They Basically. would sure ask about it first, okay. I hope. All right. <laughs> Never assume anything. <laughs> right. Joe, no, true. Yeah, but it's definitely something that the library as the hiring agency wants to think about and, and, and be cognizant of. So. Um, and then uh, it looks like we have one other question come in uh, through the back channel. Um, if your library has considered specifically creating a similar type of program, but for young adults and teens, uh, as opposed to the oldies nights, is that something maybe because you, obviously your knowledge is in the oldies. <laughs> um, right. Have you considered trying to market towards the younger group? Uh, we really haven't, although you know, it's it's always something that could be done, especially if we got a a person, say, 20 or 30 years younger than me, who loves the music of the 90s and forward from there. Um, but I think there are maybe some other folks in our community that are doing uh, programs that would fill that void. Okay. All right. Uh, one final question just came in, and I think you might have mentioned this earlier, and I don't remember if it was when we were having sound issues or not. How do you arrange the room physically? So for seating versus dance area, I know you talked about having floor versus rug, but um, you want to right. how that gets set up. Sure okay, the way our room is set up is I have like an eight-foot table that I put the audio equipment on. And then we have some card tables and another slightly larger table, and we put chairs around those and have chairs around the perimeter so there's a lot of open space, but also that room has a folding wall that when we open it up, it opens into a hallway that has a hard surface floor, and that's also where the vending machines are. So people can go dance on the hard surface floor if they want to dance. All right, great. Thanks, Bob. We, we really appreciate this, and uh, it sounds like everybody's really getting into it. Now I'm going to go you know, dig out some old Jefferson Airplane or something when I get home tonight. That's right. Um, <laughs> I, I think we should take a road trip. Oh. And, uh, 
Yeah, y'all come to Milton Freewater. Yeah, yeah I hate it. Th this month we're doing 1963, and on March 1st, or on, in April, first Friday in April, we'll be doing Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Ooh. Oh, there you go. Well, let's see. We need to get back to Wall. We need to get up to Alaska. There's a, we can, we can right. kind of plot this around and, and figure out how to yeah. Yeah. stop an organ on the way. <laughs> we're going to have to, you know, we'll get a grant. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, there you go. Get, a, get, get money. Yeah. All right. Th thank you very much again, Bob. That was wonderful.